Okay, so let me make sure this is working. We do this every day. It is so much fun. Have to make sure it works. Okay, so a couple things in real fast. Let me make some announcements. It appears to be working. Let me see. Okay, so. Yep, you can hear my echo in the background. A couple announcements. So I'm plowing through the grades and the grades always take a little bit longer on, well, it takes a long time on this. It is not, I have to go through each individually and I have to go through a bunch of different steps to get to each grade. And so if I miss something, you have to let me know. Especially, for example, a few of you did the extra credit for the uh, DBQ. You improve your DBQ and I gave most of you a few extra points. What did I just add it on? Added on to your other score. It gave you a, a, added points. And I believe I got everybody, but I'm not 100% certain. If I missed you, please check Gradebook and I will do that. I'm also going through Gradebook and adding grades, but it it would sync between teams and grade books sometimes and sometimes it wouldn't and now it just doesn't at all and I have no idea if it did or didn't or what grades it did <coughs> or didn't and so it's very easy for me to miss stuff so if I make a mistake on that please drop me a note uh, let me know and I'll get to it as soon as I can uh, and that's why I'm gonna be basically be done teaching by Wednesday and so I'm gonna give you that whole 10 days next week um, for normal finals day and Wednesday on to finish up any make uh, work and also give me a chance to go through and get the grade squared away. But I'm going through that right now. And if you're missing grades, I'm changing that to a zero. There's a few of you, you're probably not watching right now. You know, I get a lot of people watching, uh, go back and watch it. So for those of you who probably aren't watching right now, if I've got a review packet, that's a zero. And if you get a zero on that, I, <laughs> wow. Almost all of you got it turned in, but that is a huge part of the grid. And you, some of you might have just seen, I put in uh, additional X credit. I made a list of movies and I try to narrow it down, but there's a lot of good movies. Most of them I like. Uh, I have Midway on there. I've not seen the new Midway. My guess is it's cheesy as all get out, but don't forget, I have a different point of view on movies like this, especially about like Midway, which I know so much about. So I'm very picky. The movie I was thinking about was the 1977 version. Um, if you watch the new one, please let me know. Um, and I will think about, I'll probably give you an opportunity. And one more thing. I was asked about this yesterday. You can see my World War II page up here. And originally I was going to make you do Bonsai and on, on Our Way, but I decided not to. But I said, you know, I kind of threw it out there as uh, potential to do his extra credit and I will give you a few points extra credit if you do that it's for the great world at war series and so what it is is there are two different uh, links to it but it's half of the episode called bonsai which is the rise of the Japanese Empire all the way through to the fall of Singapore which was a British colony in 1942 and it, it's and has Pearl Harbor. It's, it's really well done. And then on our way, it's how the United States built up its economy, began to mobilize for war, finishing, culminating with the attack on Guadalcanal. And great video. If you do that, fill out this worksheet by uh, middle of next week. Um, the worksheet is right here. If you, if you do that, get it to me. Drop me a note. Say you did it. Um, I will give you a few points extra credit. I made the due date for the movie in July. Yeah, I want you to have it done in July. Did I really? Huh, doesn't matter. I, I meant to do it June 6th. I will go back through and do that. So you get to scroll through. I was looking for a certain uh, Green Day song and then I found uh, uh, Paul McCartney in concert. That was my, my day this morning while looking at grades. So I will keep that due through July. Um, why not? All right, so that's pretty funny. And <laughs> that's one of the things with the calendar, I guess it was, I was trying to do two things at once, multicasting. So let's go ahead then and get back to where we're at. I, I really want to get this idea of the 1960s done. There's so many misunderstandings about what happened, but the one I really want to hit is this connection between the civil rights movement and the great society and 
Vietnam. Vietnam happened, so much of the reason Lyndon Johnson did it were political issues in the United States, and that goes back to the Truman Doctrine. And that's one of the things on the quiz. A lot of you answered the Truman Doctrine on your quiz. And one of the big things about the quiz, it's um, a big thing about the Truman Doctrine is that it changed domestic politics. And here, LBJ had this almost uh, obsession to look tough on communism because he believed, as Kennedy did before him, if we don't look tough on communist, communism, um, we won't get anything we want domestically. And this right wing that is stirring up will win. Now, of course, as we know historically, looking back, this would play exactly into the hands of the right wing and the right wing conservative resurgence that would kind of start with Barry Goldwater. And I showed you the great Daisy ad, even though Goldwater got stuck. Or Goldwater got uh, defeat, defeated very bad. This is the beginning of the right wing insurgency, which is take, completely taken over. One of the two political parties that used to be much more eh, moderate, it's not the right word, but uh, not as extreme. And yes, you could turn it in in July. I won't grade it, I won't give you credit, but you're more than welcome to turn it in in July. In fact, I'll let you turn it in in August. I'll go back and change it to August. Uh, and don't forget, this is the Confederate battle flag. And if anybody tells you anything different about the Confederate battle flag, they say it's about some kind of historical artifact. 99% of the time, no. They're making a cultural statement. They're making a statement about themselves that they want you to believe. And you can think that's good or bad, but that's what it is. Um, that's one I don't like to play games with. It always annoys me when people try to lie about what they really believe. Anyways, so here's where we get this cross-section. Civil rights, Vietnam, all happening at once. And you notice how they call the civil rights movement the savage season. And that should tell you a lot about the view that many Americans had towards the civil rights. And there's going to be a growing conservative backlash that goes on to this very day. You're giving them too many rights. And there was a real fear that LBJ will not get the programs he wants, like Medicare or civil rights, through Congress if he's not tough on socialism, as you can see right here. The idea is, if we allow for Medicare, which is health insurance for the elderly, that's socialism and the communists win. Just as they said the same thing about Social Security, which Republicans still want to get, um, the hierarchy of the Republican Party, despite it is incredibly popular amongst virtually everybody, especially Republicans. But LBJ is looking at this equation. How can I get the Great Society passed if we lose in Vietnam? And he went to his advisors, and they all told him, escalate. And it would start with Operation Rolling Thunder. Rolling Thunder would be a sustained three-year bombing program of North Vietnam. What Johnson believed, actually not so much Johnson, but his advisors believed, is that if they do pinprick bombing of North Vietnam, this is that, hit key targets, North Vietnam will finally see the light and quit supporting the Viet Cong and South Vietnam will survive. So the United States technically is not at war with North Vietnam, but the U.S. begins to bomb strategic targets. That means factories, bridges, communication centers, but they're going to run out of targets very fast. And the other thing is they're going to kill hundreds of thousands of North Vietnamese civilians. And I want to be clear, there's no declaration of war. And this is going to become a big issue with what about bomber crews or fighter pilot crews? This is an F-4 Phantom. This is actually in uh, 72, but it's such a great picture. I used it anyways. What about U.S. air crew that are captured by the North Vietnamese? The U.S. will claim they deserve rights of prisoners of war. Yet North Vietnam is going to say they're not prisoners of war. Prisoners of war. You haven't declared war. They're criminals. They're terrorists. This is going to lead to, well, I think you can probably guess where this is going. And the U.S. and South Vietnam would do this, make the same justification to uh, captured Viet Cong and North Vietnamese soldiers. The brutality to prisoners on both sides would be huge. And really by the South. Okay, 
So, once the United States began bombing, they didn't want another play coup. Remember, play coup was that base that was attacked. And so the decision was, well, we have to defend our own air bases. So Da Nang was a harbor city in the northern part of South Vietnam. And in March of 1965, I, um, Johnson ordered a brigade, about 4,000 Marines, to land. And this is a big escalation because the Marines are going to go to protect the air bases. Now, a couple things about it. First off, they actually land, and those are two pictures where one got a little bit more pixelated than I wanted. And they actually landed the beaches from landing crafts like it was Iwo Jima or something, or, or D-Day. They wanted this big show for the television cameras. And I think I have the picture here. Please say I do. Nope, I don't. Ah! But they were actually met by South Vietnamese uh, girls, junior high, high school age girls, giving them flowers for this big um, photo op. And that should tell you everything you need to know about uh, the insanity of Vietnam. It starts right away. And so it's surreal for the Marines are told they might be fired upon when they got off the beach and here are girls with flowers. And secondly, once they got to protect the bases, here comes Viet, Viet Cong guerrillas lobbing mortar shells at them and taking pot shots. So the Marines want to go out and get them. They want to go fight them so they don't attack the base. So that means ground combat. Not advisors anymore, regular soldiers, ground combat. Okay, I have a question. Are the Viet Cong made up of socialists or communists? Well, first off, communism is a form of socialism. Even though there's all kinds of different kinds of, kinds of socialists and they all hate each other. <laughs> but um, I should add, the vast majority of Viet Cong, members of the Viet Cong guerrillas, were, uh, were southerners from South Vietnam and most were were probably not what we would call socialist or communist. They were nationalists. They wanted to unify the Vietnams into one Vietnam. But the leadership was from the North. And the North were at least technically communists, even though more and more they're becoming very totalitarian, which they are now, just uh, taking power. But Ho Chi Minh was a socialist. All right, so there's soon combat, but this is at the exact same time as Selma. It's in between the first Selma march and the second Selma march. And that's the big thing. Johnson now <coughs> knows that if he's going to fight for voting rights, he, can't, he won't have, he knows this, he won't have people attacking him for being soft on communism. Just like what happened with the talk and golf. So Johnson is making these little political calculations and not thinking about, remember that great word, the blowback. So, while this is going on, Johnson proposed a Voting Rights Act. And this picture shows it, it's actually amazing. Johnson's gonna give one of his greatest speeches on national television, and uh, where he, I think I have it, no. Johnson will give one of his greatest speeches on national television, where he, demands equal rights and quotes the spiritual we shall overcome one of his greatest speeches ever a true um a, a truly brilliant speech showing that johnson is willing to make sacrifices so that all americans have rights and the voting rights act would try to redress years of the vote being denied and laws passed to to make it more difficult for African Americans to vote. And uh, the Supreme Court would find the very conservative Supreme Court now, the, um, the Roberts Court, would overturn big parts of that uh, a decade ago. And that's why all of a sudden now there's all these voter ID laws and all these kind of laws to make it difficult to vote. And you can see elements of that right now. Um, those who are more conservative, tradition, this goes back to the Whig Party, the Whigs who are more conservative are going to do everything they can to keep people from voting. Everything they can. They want a small, tiny group voting because that's the elite. This goes back to Hamilton not wanting the people to vote. And those who are more liberal or progressive and want more rights for everybody, they want more people to vote. And so that's what you see right now. That's a fight about mail-in ballots right now more conservative you are, you want to make it more difficult for people to vote. The same reason why conservatives oppose the Voting Rights Act and still do. 
Okay, so he proposed this. At the same time, nothing happens in a vacuum. Johnson wasn't sitting there going, let's go pa pass the Voting Rights Act and turn on and say, oh, what about Vietnam? No, he's thinking, I gotta do both. I gotta do both. Was he correct? No. Johnson was a brilliant politician. He could have got a pass. He did not need to escalate. He, it's a fatal mistake that we as a country have never recovered from. It's uh, truly a tragedy, like a Greek tragedy. Okay, I got a question here. When did the Viet Minh become the Viet Cong? Okay, the Viet Minh, those were nationalists fighting against French, the French colony of uh, French Indochina. They want to kick the French out to become independent. That's the Viet Minh. The Viet Cong, that is the name of the, um, the name that the South originally gave to the group called the National Liberation Front that was created in South Vietnam to fight against the corrupt Zem government that the U.S. supported. So the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh are not the same thing. The Viet Cong want one Vietnam. So the U.S. wants two Vietnams. So that's the difference. And all this time, my popped. I thought you'd want to know. All this time that this is going on, as the United States started sending more troops in, guess what the North Vietnamese? Along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they begin to send in regular North Vietnamese soldiers, not just advisors and political operatives and supplies. They match the escalation. And we'll get back to that. So, escalation, escalation. And right then, this is when Johnson, troops just went in. He wants Great Society bills. He proposed it the 2nd March. He wants a Voting Rights Act. He wants Medicaid. He wants aid uh, for the war on poverty. And he goes, he sees his advisors. And there they are, all the advisors um, and, and members of Congress, including right there, that Senate Majority Leader, Mike Mansfield of Montana. Johnson asked him, and every single so-called foreign policy expert, except one, says, go in, escalate. We can win. We can win the big victory. And by winning the big victory, we can show our superiority. Sorry, I got another message. It's kind of weird. I got like three screens going. But... We can win the victory. You could come out on top. They all told them we could win. We don't need full-scale war. We don't need World War III. Just send Trump troops to South Vietnam, put the pressure on North Vietnam. Eventually they'll give in. We'll have our two Vietnams. Only one advisor told them differently. <laughs> now the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, but this was never made totally clear to Johnson. This is Johnson's fault. He should have went after it, but he, he, he's getting to the point you would, you, we all do this. You want to hear good news. You want to confirm your own biases. This happens all the time. A few said, God, this might last 10 years and 500,000 troops. But Johnson just heard, we can win and you'll come out the great victor. He won't lose Vietnam like Truman lost China. He'll win. So nobody pushed harder than Robert McNamara. Robert McNamara was Kennedy's Secretary of Defense, considered one of the most brilliant men on, in Washington, D.C. He was a former head of Ford Motor Company and a, a pretty amazing guy whose middle name is Strange, literally Strange, Robert Strange McNamara. But he believed we could force the North to the peace table to negotiate agreement for them to quit aiding the Viet Cong and South Vietnam will survive. McNamara who Johnson called his lard hair man. <laughs> Get it? Well, McNamara kept pushing for escalation. And then by the end of 67, McNamara would realize he was totally wrong. And um, Johnson by then was like, Get out of here, would fire him. But McNamara, in many ways, is going to become, going to become the symbol of uh, this attack. These incredibly well educated, in many ways, brilliant men who were completely and totally wrong about everything. And that tells you something a little bit about education. Being well-educated doesn't necessarily make you smart. It just means you know how to play the game. And it doesn't necessarily make you correct. One thing that happens if you're very well-educated and smart and successful in school, like all of you watching, I was, you know, fairly successful, 
is that you think you know everything. <laughs> you start thinking, I'm right. You begin to believe your, your, uh, your press clippings. And that's what happened to people like McNamara. It was quite a shock for him. He died about a decade ago, but he spent most of his life trying to defend his terrible mistakes in Vietnam. So what did Johnson do? Johnson decided he had no choice to escalate. He gave a press conference in June 1965 and very casually mentions that we're going to bring commit full-scale ground forces, not just a brigade of Marines. He's going to send more Marines, but more importantly, a couple different units of the United States Army, including a brand new, new unit called the Air Cavalry, which was this all helicopter based unit that could move very fast with the idea of being the French did have helicopters, the US does, we can win this guerrilla war by surprising the guerrillas. And so <clears throat> what was the justification? No declaration of war. It was a Tonkin Gulf. It was Tonkin Gulf. And these are the reasons, and this is a biggie. I'm gonna ask this specifically on the test, the quiz on Friday. So save the great society. Oh, the quiz. So I'm gonna do Friday's notes and then I'm gonna um, give the quiz after Friday no Friday's notes. And so the quiz will be on the 60s. So save the great society. Like I already said, look tough, save the great society. Save the great society, look tough on communism. He's not gonna have Vietnam shoved down his throat. He actually said something differently, I'll let you decide. Next, it's JFK's legacy. Kennedy promised that he would defend Vietnam, made it an issue. That was gonna be his last, or that was gonna be his speech before he was assassinated about success in Vietnam. And Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, had just been elected senator to New York. And he looked like he was gonna um, run for president. And he in 65 was saying that, L. Robert Kennedy was saying, Lyndon Johnson has lost Vietnam. He is destroying my brother's legacy. And Johnson did not want to be the mistake between the two Kennedys. And lastly, credibility. He was terrified that people would not trust the word of the United States. And if the U.S. says that we will defend Western Europe and West Berlin, like Kennedy did in his Ich bin ein Berliner speech, we will defend it like it's part of the U.S. Who would believe us if we don't defend South Vietnam? Now, looking back at it, it's, this is kind of like the domino theory, but it's a very convoluted argument. West Berlin has nothing to do with South Vietnam. By the way, look at those reasons carefully. I also gave you Kennedy's reasons for going into Vietnam. The domino theory, look tough on communism, Berlin, and election. Do you notice those reasons I gave for Kennedy? Also the reasons for Eisenhower, who got in in the first place. And Kennedy, and those reasons I just put there. What do you notice is missing? South Vietnam. It has nothing to do with South Vietnam. So we are going to destroy a country and kill millions of people. Keep this war going. When the Viet Cong was gonna win in 65 if the US would not have committed forces. It, there's no way there'd be South Vietnam after 66. And yet Johnson will do it for these convoluted reasons and has nothing to do with South Vietnam. But here's the kicker. He kept the cost secret. He didn't want people to know how much the United States is going to commit. So he kept the number of troops that will be needed secret. He implied it would just take a few more, a few uh, thousand troops. He kept the actual cost in money and resources and treasure. He kept all of that secret, thinking that if people knew the true cost, they wouldn't support it. So I think you might see a ticking time bomb going here. Johnson is doing this to save the great society, and yet he's keeping secret to save the great society. What happens when people realize the truth? It's going to blow up, not only in Johnson's face, it's going to crush his plans for the great society. And when you start looking at college costs, and you wonder, why is it so high? This is the roots of it. Johnson's grand plan will blow up and you can see the distrust in government start right here. When people begin to realize that Johnson was lying, he didn't tell the American public that the Joint Chiefs of Staff had told him it's going to be 500,000 troops. 
They started the draft, but he didn't call it the reserves in the National Guard, hoping to keep it uh, from affecting families as much. He tried to keep it secret. A disaster is happening. But it seemed to work. Three major pieces of legislature passed right after he committed forces, right after he commits. Medicare, which is health insurance for the elderly. And it's not complete. There are flaws in it. And you, you can't get it till you're 65. And, you know, this, by the way, this is a big boom for insurance companies. Older people are by far the most expensive to care for, uh, for health care. Oh, by the way, we all pay for it. Um, it's social insurance. We pay uh, payroll tax on Social Security, and that pays for it. It's an incredibly successful and efficient program. Medicare. Medicaid is a little bit more convoluted, but that is healthcare only for the poor. But this is means tested by wealth. And so there's a big hole between the group of people with pretty good healthcare who are poor and don't have jobs, and then all the working people and then the elderly. Boy, do we have a convoluted system. And then the Voting Rights Act passed. So here's Johnson signing <laughs> Medicare. Sorry, I have a little cough. And that's uh, Truman. And Truman wanted national health care insurance. Here he is signing the Voting Rights Act, giving the pen to Martin Luther King. There's Walter Abernathy. And uh, this seemed to work. And the Great Society really seemed to work. But Vietnam is going to gut it, literally. Rip the intestines out. But the big thing is, this Vietnam War and the distrust of government will be used quite effectively by conservatives to say, see, I told you, programs like Social Security, Medicare, government aid don't work. And I remember I went through all the trickle down economics and I told you how they don't want a safety net. They want desperate workers that drops wages. Desperate workers means basically all of us, me, and probably almost all of you. Also at this same time, we've already mentioned the Warren Court. The Warren Court's first big decision, Earl Warren, we've talked about him before when we watched The Rage Within. Earl Warren, who's right here. Earl Warren, there'd be no court in American history that would do more for civil rights than the Warren Court. And this has been, this is the last time there's been a truly liberal court. The court has gotten much more conservative every year. Um, now that we have the most conservative Supreme Court since the 1890s. But conservative means they want to get rid of these rights. But let's get back to this. Let's get to the, the big decision. We've already talked Brown versus Topeka Board of Education. I'll explain the cartoons in just a second. So a few of the court cases. The first one, Engel versus Vital. And this happened during the Kennedy administration. And this said there could be no more mandatory school prayer in public schools. And this was pretty common that there would be a mandatory prayer. And by the 1950s, they would do it over the announcements and everybody must pray. And almost all these prayers, not almost, these were all Christian prayers, usually Protestant in public schools. And when this came out, said, no, that you cannot have mandatory school prayer. And the big thing about this one was that I'm missing something here. No, okay. The big thing is that um, it didn't say you can't pray. It just said there can't be mandatory prayer. And so if you want to do your Druid prayer right now, you could do it. You could be sitting there praying to a tree or whatever, saying, you know, because you're, you're a Druid and saying that you want this class to end. You're more than welcome to pray for that. But it means that I can't force you to pray. To pr um, pray. And you can, I think you could probably get to the conservative backlash. Next. Okay, there are squirrels fighting crows on my garage. I'm not making this up. Next, Baker versus Carr. Baker versus Carr said that you can no longer make legislative districts that discriminate against African Americans. 
And this would be a key part of the Voting Rights Act to confirm parts of the Voting Rights Act. I should be very clear. This has basically been thrown out. And now there's gerrymandering like you cannot believe it to isolate um, people um, almost, well, it's almost always done by Republicans, but it's also done by Democrats to aid their party. The places like Wisconsin are infamous for it. Next, Gideon versus Wainwright. Gideon versus Wainwright said that the Supreme Court, or I'm sorry, the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution says that everybody has a right to counsel. That's the Fifth Amendment. And if you can't afford one, you then there must be some kind of system of public defenders. But every state is different. So Montana has public defenders, but they're overworked and underpaid. Tough gig. And if you go to places like Texas, they don't really don't have that system. It has to be lawyers must volunteer part of their time. And it's it's really inconsistent. Next, Miranda versus Arizona. And the Miranda case said that everybody who's arrested must be aware of their rights because the Fifth Amendment says that everybody has the right to due process. And so everybody must be aware. And soon they would start giving little cards that uh, police officers would say, and this would become the norm. They all do it, and then it would become a staple of any television show or movie with police officers. You all know them. You have the right to remain silent. If you do not, you know, that whole thing that they always say um, in every movie, that came from the Moran decision. They don't have to say those exact words, but that guarantees that people are made aware of their rights. And maybe one of the most important cases in American history, the Griswold decision. The Griswold decision in Connecticut, this is 1964, this said that there is an implied right to privacy that every person has because nowhere in the Constitution does it actually say you have the right to privacy. I should add that Montana would rewrite its Constitution in 1971 and it would say that everybody has a right to privacy. But back to this. You all have a, you all have a right to privacy. So you have certain rights to privacy and that includes you know, kind of the Fourth Amendment and no legal search and seizure. But the whole argument stemmed from Connecticut and other states did this too. They made birth control, access to birth control and various methods of birth control illegal. And the Griswold decision said that violates a person's right to privacy for birth control. And this is an incredibly important case. It's hard to find a more important case. But it's because it says a couple different things. First off, this whole idea of privacy for everybody. But the big element is it says that women have the right to privacy. And that includes women have the right to privacy for their own bodies. And this is without a doubt the most important economic issue for women and equal rights. If women cannot decide when they have children, that puts them at a massive economic disadvantage. Massive. And this will be used since the beginning of time against women. That women can have promotions or have jobs or certain things because someday they're going to have children. This was always used. And until women have control over that, they will never have equal rights. That is why the Griswold decision was so important. And I should add, that is why so much of the argument about um, birth control, and this would directly lead to abortion rights, Griswold decision would directly lead to that. So much of the argument against women having this um, right to privacy and birth control is to um, take away rights from women. It, that's just it, to simply take away economic power. And this should remind you a little bit of the Industrial Revolution and the cult of domesticity. Big decision. So, back to Vietnam. <laughs> well, all this is going on at the same time. What a time. Oh, I should add the Beatles came. And tomorrow I'll show you a couple things about the Beatles. But General William Westmoreland was the overall commander of the U.S. forces and therefore <coughs> the South Vietnamese forces. They called it MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam. And his job was to fight the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong, who were using guerrilla tactics, especially once the Americans arrived. Superior American firepower, the Viet Cong realized they're not going to be able to stand up in a set piece battle. So they're going to use hit, hit and run tactics, ambush, terrorism, and the mountains to hide. But as the U.S. sent more troops, North Vietnam, NVN, they started sending more troops in. And Westmoreland had a real problem. He didn't have near enough troops. 
the believed to fight an insurgency army called counterinsurgency, COIN, was you needed about a 10 to 1 advantage over the guerrillas. Because guerrillas can attack everywhere, so you have to defend more. To hold areas to keep guerrillas from attacking requires a lot of troops. Westmoreland did not have it. So the tactics they would adopt would be, and they all thought it would work because of helicopters, what's called search and destroy. And search and destroy would be, <laughs> helicopters will give the United States incredible mobility to bring troops in, and then in either huge operations or relatively small operations, they would go through the jungle, American soldiers, and you could just look at the misery of going through this swamp, well-equipped American soldiers right here. I should add that the rifle they were using, a brand new one called the M16, tended to jam a lot in humid climate. Won't be a problem in Vietnam. But they would go find the enemy. And here, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, once they realize American air power is too much, they begin to build thousands of miles of tunnels. And here is someone going into the tunnel. They call them the tunnel rat to root them out. And we can't go off of the details of it, but let me get to the main element of this. If it's a guerrilla army and they see large numbers of American or South Vietnamese forces, they hide and then ambush. So what do you do? You send groups out into the forest and hope they get ambushed. And then if they're ambushed, it's like, oh, they're fired from over there and blow that area away. Use air power and artillery to destroy it. By the way, artillery rounds can't tell the difference between a child and a Viet Cong. I think you might see a problem here. So, <coughs> you probably can imagine how tough this was on American morale. Tough, awful. Think about it for a second. If you're an American soldier, and about one out of 15 soldiers in Vietnam were actually combat soldiers, most of them were supply, logistics, etc. Your job is to go out into the jungle and hope someone ambushes you and shoots you from a hidden spot. How would you act? Your mind can never shut off. There's a reason why they called it from, okay, World War I, it was shell shock, okay. Civil War, it was seeing the elephant. World War I, it was shell shock. World War II, it's battle fatigue. They still called it battle fatigue in, in Vietnam, but today we say some form of post-traumatic stress syndrome. These kind of wars, the stress, you can never shut off. Be, your mind can't shut off. The stress never ends because you can be attacked anywhere. And think about American soldiers in South, in South Vietnam. How do they know the difference between Viet Cong and the uh, civilian? They can never shut off. That is why post-traumatic stress syndrome, these examples will be so high amongst soldiers coming back from Vietnam, even more than World War II in many ways. And that's why it's, it's going to be so high, and it is so high, from Afghanistan and, and Iraq right now. We have hundreds of thousands of soldiers that are young, still relatively young men right now, young men and women, who are never going to be the same. And what they would do is, how do you know you're winning? Well, they go sweep through, and then they would literally count the bodies. Okay, I've killed, there are five bodies, they must be Viet Cong, so I killed five. And they would come up a kill ratio. I killed five. We only lost one man. Five to one kill ratio. Victory. And that was the thought. If we kill so many, they have to quit. So it's attrition. And this war might go on for years, but Lyndon Johnson kept that secret. And this is how guerrilla wars are fought. This is exactly what's going to happen in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they didn't win. We're leaving now. And we lost. Because attrition, they know. The South Vietnamese know just as the, the colonial, the Continental Army knew in the American Revolution. The imperial power is going to leave someday. So, the helicopters, the thought was this could move troops in quickly, move troops out, move wounded soldiers out. More men survived wounds than ever before, but still, those men in combat would be under intense strain for the year. And what they would do is they gave a year hitch. The thought was, we want to limit the exposure. And so every U.S. soldier in Vietnam served a 12-month hitch. That's it. Except Marines. Marines, because they're Marines, they served 13, much to the chagrin of Marines. And 
They also thought was, okay, we know civilians are helping. So they tried to set up um, basically to force uh, villagers out in the countryside into these camps called strategic hamlets, concentration camps. That failed miserably. But villages where they thought maybe they're helping the Viet Cong would have to be destroyed. Well, I think if you're a villager and your village is destroyed by these, this marauding invading army that speaks a different language, you might be angry. That's creating more guerrillas. Does this remind you of the Southern strategy in the Revolutionary War? So with that, firepower would be key. What we thought is we'll make up for the the shortage of troops, because we only had about three to one advantage in numbers, not the 10 to one needed for counterinsurgency. Firepower, helicopters, we would set up areas called free fire zones that we would totally obliterate. obliterate. B-52 bombers that were designed to attack the Soviet Union with nuclear bombs were also, uh, could carry conventional iron bombs. And they would be remodeled to carry as much as 50,000 pounds of bombs, as B-52D here. And they would just simply bomb areas that they assumed were Viet Cong activity. By the way, bombs can't tell the difference between children or North Vietnamese soldiers. And millions of gallons of jellied gasoline that was first created in World War II called napalm. And we would set up these fire support bases of artillery and blow areas away. That's an American F-100 fighter dropping napalm. So the thought was firepower, which by the way, makes it a much more expensive war, but also so much more deadly. And who, most of the people will die, won't be Viet Cong or North Vietnamese soldiers, it will be civilians. Millions will die. And that's the way it's fought today. The US fights with firepower, will blow areas away. And I could sympathize if I was this guy under attack. Yeah, use napalm. But if that's a tactic for war, you're creating more enemies. Same things happened in Iraq. And so you're going to get some of the more famous pictures in American history. Some of you probably, probably already seen this one. This is a girl. This is actually 1972, but and she's running away from a uh, This is in South Vietnam, a town that's been napalm because it's under uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong attack. And her clothes have been burnt off with napalm. And it's black and white, so you can't tell, but her body is just covered with burns, third degree burns over much of her body. And she is in absolute agony. So her, this is not her just, oh, why is she running naked? She, the clothes are burnt off. And um, this was at this town bombed by napalm. That means it was bombed by, actually it was South Vietnamese planes, because South Vietnamese planes and American planes fought together. There were South Vietnamese, Vietnamese uh, they're called A-37s, which are American planes. We gave them to fight the Viet Cong. But this symbol shows the real victim in the war, and um, she's still alive, but horrifically um, burned. The U.S. would also use millions of gallons of something called, they used a couple different types, but it's an herbicide that would be dubbed Agent Orange because of the barrels that came in had an orange band around it. And the thought was if they could destroy the jungle with this herbicide, and here are planes dropping, and here's the effects of the herbicide, where would the Viet Cong hide? Well, it did not work at all. It failed miserably, and people on the ground uh, would be, if they breathed this in, they absorbed it into their skin, uh, we found out this is incredibly dangerous. A carcinogenic, many, many American soldiers would get lung, but mostly thyroid cancer, and uh, the U.S. would not acknowledge this till the end of the 1980s, and that means hundreds of thousands, I mean millions of South Vietnamese. This is done on South Vietnam. The country we're trying to defend. Don't forget that. This is the country we're trying to defend. Rolling Thunder was a more limited bombing of the North. So we're not doing this to the North. Would lead to horrific birth defects. And I'm not going to show you the pictures. You can look them up. But women who are pregnant or at an age where... Um, um, in fact, any women. Any woman from um, infancy all the way up to... Um, all the way up through adulthood, if they were caught in Agent Orange, there's a good chance that the children, any children they have will have horrific birth defects. And once again, no real thought about the long-term consequences of this. And pictures started to come back and the media started showing the realities of this war. And so here's a, this is 66, two wounded soldiers uh, waiting to be evacuated. Here 
are dead Marines being taken off a fire support base called Kaesong. This is an army base. And this dramatic picture right here, one of the more famous ones, because to many it looked like someone who was being crucified. But actually, he's waving for a helicopter, but a dramatic moment to help wounded men, as you can see right here in agony. And the thing about it is, is that the media was relatively pro-war. But these pictures, by definition, are not. And this is something about war. The truth about war, by definition, is anti-war. If people know how horrific war really is, no sane person would ever do it. And most people don't know the realities. That's why the government in, in your lifetime has done everything they could to censor the news. Uh, for example, reporters were arrested in the 2000s for showing pictures of fly-draped coffins coming home. And so the vast majority of Americans were still for the war up through most of the 1960s as a kind of a, we have no choice, we have to do it. But anti-war protests began to really pick up by 66. And it was a cross-section of society. There's a myth that was spread by more pro-war people that it was a bunch of hippies and drug addicts. Not at all. There were cross-sections of all different ages and people. Yes, there are a lot of college-age people involved with the draft because they're the age being drafted. But <clears throat> as you can see from these pictures, these are people opposed to the draft. And uh, the one thing about the draft, the draft was incredibly unfair. Draft boards would draft people, um, or draft, draft boards in every county of every place had a quota, and they would draft people um, twice a year. And if you have political connections, you weren't drafted. And they, so they could draft, <coughs> um, so only people who were kind of out of the loop were drafted. If people had, um, young men had a little bit of money, they went to college, at least until 1968, they got a deferment, didn't have to go to draft. If you, <coughs> at first, married men weren't drafted. Boy, there are a lot of hasty marriages. And if you, uh, and then eventually they would get rid of that, but they said if you had a child, you wouldn't be drafted. And, uh, and so if you had a little bit of money and connection, you could get out. So the draft was incredibly unfair. But there were a lot of counter protests saying the anti draft the anti-war movement were a bunch of communists, etc. And you'll find <coughs> a lot of these, and almost all the anti-war protests were very peaceful. And I love this one, but I love the counter-protest. Just one guy, every communist is a fink. That might be my favorite poster ever. Um, but the, the uh, anti-war protest um, and the pro-war protest would become very violent. And in 1967, one of the biggest protests in American history, as thousands of people surrounded the Pentagon in a peaceful protest to demand the end to the war. And the Pentagon, which is the biggest building in the world, they surrounded it, this, and basically the front. And McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, made sure that all these guards, you see them here, nobody had their rep, the rifles armed, no bullets in the chamber, no, they're not fixed bayonets, that would change as it went on. <laughs> And that's a famous picture of a protester in a nice sweater, putting uh, uh, flowers into the rifle barrels. What a surreal time. But here's, God, please work. A newsreel from this. Let's see if this works. And listen to how they present it. The media was basically very pro-war. Another, a better way to look at it is the media was just pro-establishment. They say we have to go, we're with you. There's a belief, and it is a pure, unadulterated myth that the media was against the war. Now, you show pictures of people dying, it's against the war. Thousands of demonstrators opposed to the Vietnam War assembled in the nation's capital for a mass protest. For the most part, orderly, Minor scuffles did occur between the demonstrators and hecklers. A three-hour parade takes the demonstrators across the Potomac on their way to the Pentagon. The crowd estimated at about 50,000 persons was a loose confederation of some 150 groups and included adults, students, even children. And um, many children 
of members of the Johnson administration. It is at the Pentagon where the first test of strength comes. Military police contain the crowd, but clashes soon break out. Federal marshals arrest several who attempt to break through the protective line. So, with that, the war <coughs> became to dominate everything Johnson did. Johnson wanted the war to, um, he wanted to fight this war so he could ignore the war. What he was hoping is that people would forget about the war, about communism, and so he can get the Great Society passed. But this was becoming a major, a major problem. Now, Johnson had a heart attack in the late 1950s. And so in 1966, we had to get emergency gallbladder surgery. A lot of people thought it was another heart attack. And so Johnson showed off the scar. And by the way, back then, scars, eh, with the equipment, they were a lot bigger scars where he got his gallbladder removed. <laughs> and he showed off this still sometimes bleeding scar. To he loved like kind of, you know, shocking the, uh, the reporters to prove it wasn't a heart attack. But in one of the most famous cartoons in American history, a political cartoonist took this scar and turned it into the map of South Vietnam, showing that Vietnam was becoming a scar within the country and dividing the country right down the middle. And the people, more liberal people who wanted the Great Society were also the same people opposed to the war. And this is going to divide support for the Great Society and also divide the Democratic Party. This, the Democratic Party never really recovered from that divide over the Vietnam War with combined with um, what was happening with the Civil Rights Movement. And Johnson, was miserable over this. As the protests continued, he suffered immensely. Now, I don't want to compare his suffering to what's actually happened in Vietnam, but the point was he did not take this lightly. It wasn't like Johnson was, was uh, doing this casually, as um, the argument would made that uh, future presidents would do. Johnson um, would personally sign every letter to, to every family that... Uh, um, whose soldier who had a son or daughter dying in Vietnam, he would he every he would wander the halls of the White House looking for reports for the news. He just agonized about this. But now he was able to convince himself because people are amazing how they could justify things that he had no choice. But he had a choice, and that was the tra the tragedy of Vietnam. By the way, the taping thing that should be on, ominous. While this is going on. A period developed that would soon be dubbed the long, hot summers. <laughs> and what that meant was protests in mostly large urban areas in the north. And these would be called race riots. But um, they were protesting the segregation that was happening, not, um, not completely lead, um, by law segregation. So that's why it's called de facto segregation, even though there were laws real estate laws that deny blacks the right to live in certain areas called redlining. But this de facto segregation in the North was not affected by the Civil Rights Act or the, of 64 or the Voting Rights Act of 65. There was still incredible, incredible segregation and racism in the North and economic divide. And so much of this was about economic justice. The leaders of the civil rights movement made it very clear. And King's speech in, in, on the March of Washington in 1963 said this, but nobody remembers that part, that it's not enough to change laws. You have to end poverty for everybody or they'll never be true, true equality between the races. It won't happen. And this is where it gets complex. And so... <coughs> Almost all of these began with some example of police violence, um, which is just amazing because it's happening right now in Minneapolis, literally right now, as protests, as a police officer looked like he murdered a, a man and they filmed it. I, I can't even wrap my mind around this, except for this just this happens all the time. 
to, to most, mostly young black men. That's what happened in Newark and other places. Watts is a part of uh, Chicago, uh, Detroit, or I'm sorry, Watts is a part of Los Angeles and Detroit, Newark, but happened in New York City. Virtually every major city would have these. And the thing was, <coughs> is that these protests began because expectations went up dramatically. We've got rid of Jim Crow. We got rid of Voting Rights Act. And people are like, our lives will get better. And yet in these urban areas that have been suffering through urban blight and destabilization, their life wasn't better. And it just the upswelling of anger. And that's why long, hot summers. If you ever spent, if you ever been to New York City or Newark or those places in the summer, the average temperature is a million degrees with a million percent humidity. Which, by the way, might feel that way if you live in a city with everything's paved and no air conditioning. When these expectations weren't met, examples of police violence, it was like, we can't do this anymore. But Lyndon Johnson would make a very famous statement that I decided to cover up. I think I moved that so you can see. Johnson at first had great sympathy for this. And what he said is, if you can't read it, I know some of you are looking at a little screen. He said, what do you expect? I don't know why you're so surprised. When you put your foot on a man's neck and hold him down for 300 years, and then you let him up, what's he gonna do? He's gonna knock your block off. And he, so he had great sympathy putting himself in that position, but soon he wouldn't have sympathy because he's like, I passed these laws for you. But remember what I told you, these laws, the Great Society laws are being gutted by Vietnam. And also you have the draft that is, if you're fairly wealthy, you can get out and the poverty rate amongst African-Americans was incredibly high, put the two together. And so soon <coughs> these will erupt in horrific violence. The army would be called out in, not just the National Guard, the army, and this is in Detroit, that's in Los Angeles, and this is in Newark. And in 67, the protests in Newark that drummed up, the police there had snipers, and they ordered the snipers to kill. Now, these are sn police snipers to kill any black man they saw on the street. I can't even wrap my mind around that. That's, as you can see right there, that's a 12-year-old boy who was hit in the head by a sniper. And at least 15 people would be murdered by police snipers and a significant number of americans and you can kind of figure out where they're from said they had no choice they had to do it and what happened was nonviolent civil disobedience why that worked is it could show that one side was moral and one side was immoral but once these turned in the north where people said that's not enough we want to fight back then this showed people who believed that there are racial differences, that thought racism was natural. This proved their point. Look what they do to their cities. That's why you can't give them rights. That's why we have to crack down. And this gave an excuse to crack down and blew everything up. And this is gonna to lead to a change in the civil rights movement, away from the more peaceful elements to something we call black consciousness. And what soon evolved to black power. And black consciousness is simply this, that African-Americans began to realize that there is um, nothing wrong with being black. Black is good. In fact, the slaying was black was beautiful and blacks can have power. And so what I mean by that is if black is good, think about, this goes back to racism. I talked about color and all the darker was always seen as more evil and light was good. Well, they're saying no. And so what would happen is, is that um, lighter skinned African-Americans seem to be a little bit closer to whites and therefore have more rights, must be smarter. Um, for a lot of African-Americans, they would try to act uh, whites, try to get their hair straight to look more like uh, somebody from Europe and um, of European ancestry. And that uh, and therefore they tried to act white. And they said, no, there's nothing wrong with being black. And that's where you get, for example, a change in style, uh, allowing hair to grow up, it, um, grow up uh, to, they actually called it at first, um, 
African style, but Afros. Um, curly hair, and uh, this is the way we're supposed to look, and not supposed to look, not going to straighten it out. And uh, you can see right here, that was actually a major political statement. And black nationalism said, hey, we can maybe never trust black. We can never trust whites. And we're going to have to go on our own. Whites are going to always be racist. And you could imagine how this is going to make a lot of whites in the United States and very afraid. Sure, they might say, Jim Crow was bad, but I'm not a bad person. Well, it's more complex than that. So they want a more direct action. And Stokely Carmichael would become one of the most charismatic leaders of the Black Power movement. There he is in the bottom. He's a pretty amazing guy. But he said, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. If, if he's got the power to lynch me, that's my problem. Racism is not a question of attitude. It is a question of power. And he got it. Racism, remember, last thing for today, racism goes back to Bacon's Rebellion and it was about a certain group of planters wanting to maintain power. Racism as we know it, it's power. It's not this, I don't like them and that's bad. If I just change my attitude, it goes away. No, it's power. And sure, it was fine for a lot of whites in the North, especially, to say, oh, let's get a Jim Crow laws. That's, that's um, Jim Crow laws are bad. I want to get rid of that. But if it's going to change my power relationship, in fact, for a lot of them, if I'm going to, yeah, I want to get rid of Jim Crow laws in Montgomery, but I don't want blacks living in my neighborhood because that takes away from my power. Remember, for most people, this was the argument in the South. For most people, they don't have much. So they hold on to what little bit of power they have. And for racism, what is that power? I don't have much, but I'm white. And this is a direct attack. And you can see the backlash. And you can see where one of the political parties is going to take advantage of this. The first gun laws in the United States to control guns would be to keep weapons out of the hands of black people in the 1960s. You see a similar thing in um, Jim Crow laws. Uh, just watch the protests now. The protests that happened all over the country against wearing masks, you know, um, against uh, people saying that um, I want to, I guess, spread disease and make your grandmother sick. Those people who want, um, who don't want to wear masks, they all have guns. What happened? Um, can you imagine what's happened in Minneapolis if people came out there with guns? What would happen? Can you even comprehend that? And this is where it comes from. So, the blowback will be huge. So, that's where we'll quit tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll go through this. And then, after tomorrow, then I'll put the quiz up. Wow. This is why I want to... Someone might be wondering. <laughs> I'm going a little bit slower. It takes so much longer. I have no idea. But I really wanted to get to these things. Mail. Because so much of what's happening now, you can, and you can see this with racism, you can see this with uh, class divide, it happened in the 1960s. And if most people don't know this stuff, and I, I want to make sure I covered it. So, on that happy note, I am done. So, Tomorrow I'll finish this up. I will play a little bit of music tomorrow. And also I just had to check. I was going to say if the crows are attacking, I was going to bring the camera out and let you see that. But the crows are left. I guess the uh, there's been a some kind of truce out there between the uh, crows and the squirrels. It's a titanic fight. And wait until the grackles get here.